Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss an update. Leave a comment below to help grow the channel, and don't forget to smash the like button. Okay, lecture 87, transverse waves on a string, hence the guitar. We'll come back to the guitar a little bit later. But let's talk about waves on a string. So, for starters, what does transverse wave mean? Well, there are generally two types of waves, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Longitudinal waves, the motion is in the direction of the wave velocity, and that's what we'll study when we look at sound waves, for example. Transverse waves, the motion is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. So if the wave velocity is, say, this way, the motion of the wave is going up and down like this, you see? So lots of waves are transverse waves, water waves, for example, the waves on the guitar, uh, waves on a string in general, um, light waves are transverse waves. Okay? So here's the setup. If I have a string well, tied to a wall, it's very, very far away, okay? And it'll be tethered here as well. If I were to pluck this string, I could get a little wave bump or wave pulse, which is traveling in this direction, so with speed v, okay? You can kind of imagine that, right? Yeah. This is not the same as when I play the guitar. These are standing waves on the guitar. And we'll talk about standing waves a bit later. But, uh, yeah, this is a traveling wave. If you just wiggle the string up and down briefly, right, you get a little jerk on it, right, it'll send a little pulse down the string, okay? Um, so last time we derived the wave equation. This time we're going to come up with a wave equation uh, from Newton's laws for a string, okay? So we have to set this thing up, and we also have to restrict what we're considering here. The amplitude, the size of this little pulse or packet is, uh, is rather small, okay? And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. So what I want to do is just consider a little tiny section of this wave, like from here to here, okay? And so it's going to look something like this, maybe, and I want to consider a deviation from the horizontal, right? So the string has tension. It will not support a shear, okay? So the tension here is in this direction. The tension here is in this direction. And it makes an angle. I should make this a bigger line. Give me a second here. A little bit longer. It makes an angle theta. We'll call this theta 2. And we'll call this angle theta 1. Okay? Now, you don't have a wave unless these two angles are a little bit different. Okay? So what do I mean by that? So if I add up the sum of the forces here, right, the sum of the forces, and I'm only concerned about the up and down motion, okay? Um, I'm not worried about in the, we'll call this the x direction, x, and we'll call this the y direction, okay? The velocity of this wave is going to be in the x direction, though, okay? It's a transverse wave because the motion, right, the up and down is in the y direction, okay? And that's perpendicular to the direction of its velocity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what are the sum of the forces here? Well, in the up and down direction anyways, you can see that here's a component of the tension times the sine of theta 2, right? And over here we have, I should give myself a little more room, make this line a little bit bigger. This is theta 1. So here is a force which is in minus t sine of theta 1. Does that make sense? Do you see how I got that? From this point here, right, it makes an angle with the horizontal of theta 2, right? And so this little component in the upwards direction is the tension in the line, which I'm assuming is the same throughout, okay, times the sine of theta 2, right? Yeah. But what the opposite is this side over here, right? So that's this component, yes? Yes. So the sum of the forces is T times the sine of theta 2 minus, why minus? Because it's going in the opposite direction, right? Yeah. T sine of theta 1. Okay? Are we good on that so far? That's just the sum of the forces. Now, Newton's second law, right, says that this is equal to the mass times acceleration, right? But I'm going to write this mass a little bit differently. This string, we will say, has a, what do we call it, a line density, I think it's called, of, you take the mass, you divide that by the length of the string, okay? 
The total mass of the string divided by the total length of the string gives you this line density, okay? And so if I want to get the mass of this little, little bit of string here, this is a bit of string which has length delta x approximately, right? Yes? So how much does it weigh? What well, weighs mu, this linear density, times delta x, right? That's the amount of mass in this part of the string, okay? Uh, this times the acceleration will be equal to t times sine theta 2 minus sine theta 1. Yes? Um, so I am assuming here that the angles theta 1 and theta 2 are really small. So this is not going to be true. This equation that I'm going to derive will not be valid for really large amplitude vibrations or waves, right? Yeah. Um, this equation, so far, well, except for the delta x, right, because the delta x is only approximately equal to the length of this line segment if the angles are small, right? So the amplitude is not very big, so it's like the string is really just kind of flat. I've exaggerated the drawing here so we can see what's going on a little bit better, okay? All right. But for the most part, this is almost exactly correct, but now I'm going to bring in some approximations. Now, normally you'd say, oh, you're going to do the small angle approximation for sine and say it's equal to the angle, right? But uh, I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm going to say that in the limit of small angles, that the sine of theta, in general, is equal to the tangent of theta. OK? And the tangent of theta right, is equal, because what is the, the tangent of theta is just the sine over the cosine. And in the limit of small angles, remember that the cosine is about 1. right? It's 1 plus 1 half the angle squared. right? So if we just keep that first term, the 1, Right, then the tangent of theta is approximately equal to the sine of theta, right? Yeah. Okay. But the, the tangent of theta, well, that's just this delta y over the delta x, right? So delta y over delta x. See that? Yes. Okay. And I'm actually going to call it for now, anyways. I'm just going to call this f of x, okay? Yes? Yes. So what do I have now? I've got that mu delta x times the acceleration. Now I'm going to write the acceleration like we did the other day, okay? I'm going to write it as del 2y over del t squared, delta t squared, right? And that's going to be equal to t times f, I'll call this, uh, well, I guess we can make it f of theta, huh? f of theta, I guess. f of theta 2 minus f of theta 1. But that's really just t times delta f. Yes? You see that? Yes. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to divide both sides by mu delta x, so that I get delta 2y over delta t squared equals t over mu times delta f over delta x. But this is just t over mu times delta y over delta x over delta x, right? So it's kind of the change in that. So this is, of course, the term that we wrote yesterday as del 2y over del x, delta x squared, OK? It's a funny notation. I don't. I can't find a, a, a perfect way to, to map it without using calculus. Okay? okay, but it's just it's the change in the gradient of or the remember the gradient is like the grade of a road, right? Yeah. So as you walk in the x direction, it goes up by some amount y, right? So the change in the slope. So it's the rate of change of the slope where the rate is with respect to the distance that you're traveling in this direction. Okay, if that makes sense. So here we have this. Um, I can eliminate the stuff in the middle here so we can see that what we have and compare it with what we had yesterday, right, where we said the general wave equation looks like this. Delta 2y over delta t squared is equal to velocity squared times delta 2y over delta x squared. And so we conclude then, right, that v squared is equal to t over mu, this line density or linear density. So that means that the velocity of this wave is equal to the square root of t, the tension in the line, divided by mu, the 
linear density of the string. Okay? And we get, though, this nice wave equation, right? So we've derived the wave equation from Newton's laws. Uh, it's only applicable if the amplitude is small. So it can't be a huge wave, right, on the string. It has to be a small wave on the string. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to show that you can derive from Newton's laws the same wave equation that we came up with the other day. Uh, and in this case, in particular, we, we get what the velocity component for the wave on a string is, OK? And this brings us back to the guitar. So let me just erase the board. So on the guitar, we have two E strings. OK, they play the note E. There's the low E string. We call that E2. And then there's the high E string, which we call E4 in music notation. They differ by two octaves. You'll, if you look at the guitar, you'll see that the low E string is quite fat right, and heavy. The high E string, the E2, is very thin. OK? So you can imagine that the linear density, the amount of mass per unit length, in the fat string is much bigger than the linear density in the high E string. Okay? okay? And so we're going to use that to explain the difference in the pitch that you hear. Okay? Um, something to be noted, and again, we haven't talked about standing waves yet, but let me tell you this. The wavelength of the fundamental is twice the length from here to here. You can kind of imagine a sine wave Starting here, reaching a maximum amplitude somewhere here, and then back down again, and then down, and then back up, OK? Um, and the illustration would make that more clear. But I think we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, standing waves. But the wavelength is basically the same for each of these strings. Another thing that's also the same here is the tension in the strings. If you were to make say, one of the strings much more tense than the other strings, it would make it very difficult to play. Because when you're playing, you have to fret it. You have to push the string down, OK? And so if these strings, for example, were easy to push down, whereas these strings were really tight, so you had to push really hard, you might not be able to fret it, right? So in general, when you tune up a guitar and you design a guitar, you want to design it such that the tension in each of the strings is approximately the same. Okay, so we're going to make that assumption that the tension in each of the strings is approximately the same. And let's see if we can't come up with how it is that this string and this string have two different pitches. So for starters, right, we're going to note that the linear density of the E2 string, that's the low E string, is greater than the linear density of the E4 or the high E string. Okay? That means there's more mass per unit length in the low E string than there is in this one. If I were to draw a cross section of the strings, it would look like this versus something like this, OK? I also need to write down the relationship between the wave speed, the wavelength, and the frequency, OK? And you might remember from the other day, I'm going to write U as the wave speed instead of V, OK? And you'll see why in just a second. But if u is the wave speed, right, this is equal to lambda over t. That was yesterday. We talked about that, right? Yeah. That's the wavelength divided by the period. Yes? Yeah. But 1 over the period can be written as nu. This is why I didn't want to write a v, because my nu's end up looking like my v's. OK? This is called the frequency. And it's related to omega, which we saw yesterday, which is equal to 2 pi over this, the, ten, uh, the period. OK? So this T is not the tension. I, I know that's confusing that we have a T up here. But this is the, the period T, OK? Um, so that means that we can write U as lambda times nu. Now, why am I interested in nu? Well, because nu is the frequency, right, in hertz. OK? So you, if you're familiar with piano or something like that, you might know, you know, A is, middle A is 440 hertz, OK? We can characterize the sound, the pitch, of these strings uh, in frequency. Okay, so we would write that mu or nu um, e2 is equal to 82.41 hertz. That's the low e sound that you hear. Okay, nu of e4, two octaves higher. That's this number times four, is 329.41. 6, 3 hertz. I guess we don't really need the decimal points there. but 
There. Good enough, right? Um, so these, notice that the higher pitch has a higher frequency. That means there are more oscillations per second. Yes? Yeah. So you can kind of see how this might be related to the wave speed, right? So I want to use this equation, right? Mu E2 is greater than mu E4. And I want to use this equation for the wave velocity. But I'm going to write it as u here. u, right? So let's substitute in for, for mu, OK? So that's going to give me, uh, well, I would square this. And that would give me t over mu, which means that I could solve for mu. And I would get that mu is equal to t over u squared, or v squared, right? Let's go ahead and square this over here. All right, that squares everything here. And so now I have the wave speed in terms of the frequency squared, OK? So I can make that substitution in here, right? I'll replace uh, u squared with lambda squared uh, nu squared. So this is equal to t over lambda squared and then times 1 over nu squared, the frequency. You see that? This, however, right, like I said, you want the tension on the guitar for each of the strings to be the same approximately. And the wavelength is set by the distance between the bridge and the neck, right, or the nut, they call it. So this ratio, t over lambda squared, is just a constant. We'll just call this c. So we'll call this c over nu squared. And that's mu. So that means that mu e2 is going to be some constant c over nu e2 squared. And that's greater than c over nu e4 squared. Well, the c's will cancel, right? Because they're the same constant. And then I can cross multiply this to get that nu e4 squared is greater than nu e2 squared, which is what we kind of expected, right? So we've shown why it is. It's the reason that, the, that it's different is because of the difference in mu, right? The heavier gauge string right, is going to have a lower frequency that it responds with when the wavelength and the tension is fixed, you see? Yeah. So that was kind of uh, what I wanted to explain coming from what we did for waves on strings to show why it is that the two strings, despite being at the same tension and having the same wavelength, uh, have different frequencies. It's because their wave speeds are different. And their wave speeds are different because their linear density is different. So you'll see that that's the case on all of the strings, the E, the A, the D, the G, the B, the E again, right? Is that each of those strings have a slightly different uh, mass, uh, linear mass density, OK? And that's what makes them sound different. Any questions about that? And we'll come back to the guitar for other examples. I think uh, when we talk about beats or beating and wave phenomenon, uh, I'll use the guitar as an example there. It's a, a way that people like to tune guitars based on beats. And you can hear it rather clearly there. Um, I think that's all I've got on this one. Okay? Okay, that's it.